Good morning and welcome to the CAVE webinar for the 8th of January 2020. Today we're looking at Future Home Standard. My name is Jordan and I'm the Training and Events Administrator here at CAVE and I'll be acting as moderator for this morning's session. We like to make our webinars interactive so we do encourage you throughout the session to send in any questions as we go along. We'll address these at the end of the presentation with a short Q&A session. So to get in touch with us, you can type in any questions. There's a little panel showing on your screen, either at the top or the side, depending on how you're viewing this today. Just go to the question panel and then type them in for us. These will appear on my screen. And once we get to the end, we'll look through the questions with Graham. We get a lot. I may not be able to, have to address all of them, but what we can do is forward any unanswered questions to Graham outside of this morning's session. If you're watching via YouTube, you can still ask questions. Simply send them to the info at cbuildy.com email address. And if you're on Twitter, you can chat to us by using the hashtag CAVECPD. So this morning's presenter is Graham Wright. Graham is Dykin UK's Legislation and Compliance Manager and is now president of the Heat Pump Association. He is a mechanical engineer who has worked in the air conditioning industry for 35 years and has project managed some of the largest chiller projects in London and worked in product marketing and engineering across Europe for three major AC manufacturers. So if you just give me a couple of seconds, I'll hand over to Graham and he'll take control and go through this morning presentation with you. Good morning, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan, for all of that. Good morning, Graham. <laughs> uh, I'm just seeing if I can get my screen to come with full screen. I think I just have. Um, and in which case, I'm going to wish everyone all the best for the new year. I think I could just about do that, being that it's the 8th of January. Um, and I actually think it's going to be quite a momentous year for uh, for the UK, notwithstanding the fact that I expect us to be out of the EU by the end of 2020. Uh, but in many respects, we're going to have a new set of building regulations in place um, by the end of 2020. Uh, and these, these regulations should put us on the path to reach uh, zero carbon by 2050. That's the aspirations of government at the moment. So um, what I'd like to do is take you through some slides that will show the reasoning behind that and then also some understanding of, uh, of what may or may not be changing. Um, with that in mind, um, I'm going to talk about today something to do with the climate, so obviously a bit of an introduction as well. Um, talk about the generation revolution, which is a bit of a play on words because we've all seen the windmills being planted around the UK and they have a significant effect along with the solar panels. And then finish up with some regulations and guidance and uh, kind of see where the role of heat pumps would play out um, in the future. Um, did, the UK was the first uh, country globally to introduce a net zero target by 2050. There have been some others, but we actually signed up to a change that would ensure that we meet z net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, which is a significant target. It's a massive challenge for us. Of course, when that came out, there was lots of press. Uh, the first photograph you can see there were the power stations. Um, I kind of smile at because there's only one um, chimney out of that lot that's actually producing the CO2, the rest is water vapour. Um, and there was lots of pictures of traffic on motorways now. Um, I, I'd like to say to everyone that uh, I wish these traffic jams wouldn't ex won't exist in 2050. I think they will, unfortunately, but I think the cars that will be, be around will actually be being powered by electricity or possibly hydrogen. Um, so there will be no getting away from the traffic jams around the M25 that I had to suffer with this morning. And of course, the guy who signed on this is a guy called Chris Skidmore. He actually put pen to paper and agreed it. Um, so being a bit cynical about the situation, you could safely say if it all goes wrong, it will be Chris's fault. But if it all goes well, um, obviously politicians will be clamouring to, 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 to claim it was our idea. And um, forget my cynicism about it, because obviously there's been a lot said over the past sort of six, six months since we, passed, since we passed this regulation. Let's move swiftly on to climate. Uh, 
uh, and climate change is actually high on the agenda for everyone. You, just, you don't even have to think about what's going on within Australia and other countries. Look at the winter we're having at the moment. It's a bit of a grey and mild affair at this precise point. And some people are saying this is a clear indication that we are having an impact on the environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and it's, it, it, when you start to look at the numbers, uh, this is some the, the, the numbers of CO2 uh, calculated or calculated, actually emitted and, and monitored at a, uh, a station in Hawaii. It wasn't very long ago that we were suggesting that we wouldn't get past 200 parts per million. And, and then it was 400 parts per million. And we seem to have sailed straight past that. Um, so that, so we can clearly see that we are having a significant effect uh, on the environment with the amount of CO2 emissions that we're emitting. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that our climate seems to be changing. Uh, the Met Office data for 2018 says, you know, we had a very, very warm year. Listening to the radio this morning, people were saying they can, they're growing vines in Wales. You know, the, those kind of things are going on. Um, it's clearly showing that we have an impact on the climate. The Committee on Climate Change, which is a government body, which is a body that's been set up by government to, to monitor these things, has got two scenarios in place. One suggesting that there would be something in the region of a one and a half degree change in, within the UK, which is looking kind of uh, a low estimate at the moment. The, uh, the other one is a, a high, as high as a, a four and a half degree increase by, by 2100. Uh, and that will have a significant impact on, on the environment within the UK and, and the way that we would live, um, because obviously conditions are going to be warmer. The Committee on Climate Change were also have given us some data that look at the amount of CO2 emissions that are being emitted from buildings. So, you know, if I look at direct CO2 emissions, we, we emitted something like 83 million tonnes of CO2 in 2017. Some interesting numbers come out of this. 76% uh, uh, was emitted by homes. That's a, that's a massive number, really, when you think about it. And then if you then start to look at it again, commercial buildings, 14%. Now, I was reasonably impressed with this. I thought the number would be quite higher. But if you start to add that up with public buildings, you can see that 70% or 75% of all the building of, of, of our emissions comes from homes. So it wouldn't surprise you that uh, the government are beginning to uh, are focusing on, uh, on homes in this particular area. Uh, and, and part of the consultation documents that are going out is on the future home standard. Uh, buildings are responsible for 66% of electricity consumption. So again, that's not a surprising uh, number, um, but it's something we obviously can do. We can we can look at by trying to reduce the amount of electricity we're using in buildings, as well as other uh, gases, etc. Indirect emissions have been falling at an average of 8% per year since 2009. Now that's interesting in in the context of that we've been changing the way that we generate our electricity, uh, which I'll talk about next. And then uh, around about 2 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents are coming from other emissions like methane and nitrous oxide. Um, again, which is something that's been brought into the fore a little bit with the amount of emissions that have been generated by using, shall we say, biomass and other, and other types of uh, heat emitting devices. So let's move swiftly on into what I call this generation revolution. As I said, it's a bit of a play on words because if I look at the way our electricity is generated, there's been a significant change. We've actually moved from, uh, should we say, burning fossil fuels to a significant number, uh, amount of electricity generated by uh, renewable sources such as solar, wind, um, hydro, and, and, other, and other areas. Um, and this diagram clearly shows that. But if I look at CO2 emissions, um, the, the story is actually quite quite significant. In in 2013, building regulations actually stated that for every kilowatt hour of electricity we generated, we emitted 519 grams of CO2. Um, if you look at SAT 10 and also the GLA are quoting a figure of 233. And within the consultation documents, you'll see a number beginning with you know, 100, 150, 160 grams of CO2 emitted for every kilowatt hour of electricity. So that, that, is a, that is a massive change in terms of the way that we have um, generating our electricity. And it is a true revolution in my mind. No one thought that we'd be in this particular situation within 10 years. And of course, uh, the expectation is, 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 is that will continue. Uh, the 
the Committee on Climate Change have actually had a reasonable guess, I believe, on, on where we would be in 2050. And you can see the numbers here. Uh, quite clearly, we can see that uh, uh, we reduced the amount of CO2 emissions significantly between 1990 and 2017. Uh, and then there are some, some obviously some changes in the way that we are using electricity but in, by 2050 we can see that the, the amount of CO2 emissions will be will be you know, reduced dramatically uh, and even there is some suggestion that we'll be able to use carbon capture um, as part of our part, part of our generation mix which is all good news I believe so to, to kind of wrap this up in some respects, we can see that power emissions for electricity generation have fallen by 50% since 2013 and 64% since 1990. Building emission, emissions from buildings have fallen by 13% since 2013 and around about 20% 20, 20 below the levels they were in 1990. Now, this has been driven by um, obviously us taking in on board some um, uh, energy efficiency measures, but it's been mainly driven by the fact that we're reducing the amount of CO2 emitted by generation, as I've just said. But there's been generally a low uptake on energy efficiency measures and limited deployment of low carbon heating options, for instance. You know, there aren't that many heat pumps installed into the UK market domestically at the moment. In fact, there's a number of about 25,000. And when you compare that to borders uh, replacements of about one and a half million, you can quite clearly see that the UK has not adopted heat pumps as a uh, a means of heating homes. They have in commercial buildings to a certain degree, but it's part of the mix. Uh, transport emissions have increased by 6% um, by 2013, uh, and are now 4% higher than, uh, than 1990. So, yeah, again, that's another area that we really need to, uh, to, to focus on. And I think the move to electric vehicles is probably going to drive some, some changes in, that, in those areas. Waste emissions have fallen by 69%, another massive number, and that's been driven by a tax. Now, if there's a lesson to be learned, if you put a tax on something, we'll stop using it. So maybe government will be looking at those kind of things in the future. And of course, this is all to do with biodegradable waste and, la and landfill. So again, I, I think a reasonably good news story. So let's, let's move on to the uh, uh, regulations and guidance and where we, where we actually stand. Now, we've obviously been on a trajectory that has been reducing the CO2 emissions or trying to reduce the CO2 emissions from buildings for some time. We started off 2006 with a realignment of building regulations from the previous version. 2010 looked at a system approach to building regulations. 2013 was uh, seen to be a significant change, but actually only turned out to be an incremental change because of lobbying by certain areas uh, within in within the UK, you know, obviously developers and, uh, and other areas were, were actually quite powerful at that point in time. And some of the changes that we were expecting to see, like a 25% reduction in uh, emissions from buildings, was actually watered down to 11 from a domestic point of view. It probably wouldn't surprise you that there was actually what we call a cost optimal view. Now, uh, this is my personal view. The cost optimal review mean, does, means they're not going to do very much. They actually did a desktop review of where we stood with building regulations in 2016. Now, this review was driven by the fact that we actually were part of uh, the European Building Directive. Um, and we legally had to review our building regulations in 2016. And of course, nothing really much happened because we could see how we kind of banked the CO2 emissions we were getting from general generational um, uh, reductions. 2019 was kind of going to be the same. Um, in fact, it was it was always in line, and then there was a bit of a surprise when when obviously things started to change. The the change was was actually driven by uh, by the incident at Grenfell Tower. Um, as I say, 14th of uh, June 19, uh, sorry 2017, fire broke out in the tower, um, and it was a significant incident. Um, 72 people died, 70 injuries um, occurred, and Dame Judith Hackett was appointed to carry out a review of the calls. Her reports, and um, the first one in Building a Safer Future is probably worth a read, and um, there are other documents that are coming out, some have been focusing on what happened with the fire brigade, which I'm not going to touch on here, um, but the more detailed reports on what actually happened uh, uh, with, with some, some of the, some, shall we say, some of the aspects of the building that's going to come out in the future. But uh, the building safe future basically highlighted the fact that the 
the fire was caught by a fridge freezer. The fire reached the outside of the building um, due to some issues with windows, etc. It, it caught fire to the uh, thermal the insulation on the outside of the building, which was in, in there to improve the thermal efficiency and reduce the CO2 emissions from the building. Um, and the fire, the cladding caught fire, even though it was uh, tested and, and Nick subsequently failed a fire testing um, situation. Dame Judith did, did Hackett called for a radical reform. Um, she basically said building regulations are way too complex. Product testing is not always valid or correct. Uh, and I think that can be seen in you know, some of the things that we have to test for today. Um, some are required, some are probably not. And in her view, building regulations have to undergo a major review. So that kind of redrew the map somewhat. Um, uh, and this is where we currently stand. We, we, we obviously had the incremental change in 2013, but now we have a full review being undertaken for Partel. Um, but that review is in place because we ha obviously have to do it because of our uh, taking into the UK law, the EPBD regulation, which means something's got to be in place by the end of 2020. The Future Home Standard consultation is out in place at the moment, and that has to be back by the 10th of February, and, and, and everyone listening can actually uh, join in, you know, make, make their comments to this on the questionnaire that is, uh, that's been issued by MHCLG, and it's on government websites. Probably not so well known, there are also uh, consultations on commercial buildings, so there'll be changes to those. And also there, there's a look at overheating, um, because it's been seen that actually as we start to increase the U values used in buildings, sorry, use, uh, use U values in buildings, sorry, decrease the U values in buildings, um, we, we actually run into a situation where we might start to overheat homes and, and offices, especially as the climate starts to change. And there is also a, um, a tacit recognition that, that actually we need to get ourselves onto zero, this path to zero CO2 emissions, but, and, 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 and doing that, we would actually have a, a review of building regulations in 2025. Um, where the aim would be, uh, and again, I will say this is the aim, it's not written down in law, um, that we would actually look to have zero CO2 emissions from new buildings. Probably five years too late, but that's possibly where it needs to be because that gives industry a chance to change and when i say industry i'm talking about the people who build the homes build offices as as well as us looking at designs for buildings and then um, possibly there'll be another version of part l in 2030 and i just put in there um, uh, you know possibly looking at the circular economy because by that time we'll be looking at ways of recycling things in my view uh, Dame Judy Tackett said building regulations are too complicated. Well, uh, they're already devolved. Uh, anyone working across the UK know that we have Part L for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England. And uh, each area of the country is trying to outdo each other. In fact, there's some significant differences between um, Scotland and the UK in the way they've used heat pumps, and in fact, they're using hybrid heat pumps to a degree. And there are some other issues in here that really need to be th thought about, and, and they're part of this consultation, is, you know, is where do we keep the compliance guides? Uh, these guides are, are kept outside of the building regulations as they cur were currently standing, uh, but they are there as guidance for everyone to use. Uh, yes, albeit they are very much out of date and government doesn't like changing them very much, but in that context, uh, I actually think they serve a purpose to give people an understanding of what they need to do or what the performances are for equipment. So there's a discussion about where the compliance guides would reside. They could possibly reside within the building regulations themselves, which would suggest that they are being cemented into uh, any changes that go with building regulations, so they wouldn't be changed for another five years. Uh, they could possibly be held by professional bodies, you know, like CABE or possibly other organisations that could, um, in, in that context, hold a guide that would be uh, probably managed by government or managed by a body or uh, about several people to make sure that significant changes were put in too quickly. But there's a question mark over there. And there's also a question mark about what role do the skills play? Um, you know, we're, we are all uh, qualified people. Uh, we'll, be, we'll take part in these, in these associations because we want to improve the standards of how things are done. But how, how do building regulations actually audit that? Um, you know, we're kind of in a situation where 
uh, most people, the qualifications are just accepted. You know, perhaps there should be some kind of auditing process that's needed to say that someone can actually design a building or design a system. Perhaps an auditing process for installers to make sure that they are actually capable of installing the equipment. Again, these aren't directly asked within the, within the future home standard, but there's a kind of a, a connection in within that, within there about skills. And, and, and I, I can see something coming through building regulations, or if not, the Buildings Act that possibly may change. Again, um, this is my personal view, so I can't really say it's going to happen for death. As I said earlier, building the future home standards is already out. Uh, commercial buildings is also out now, um, and uh, the, the consultation finishes on the 10th of February. So please feel free to uh, go through the, the questionnaire if you wish. And I, and I know lots of organisations are doing that at this moment in time. It clearly states, though, that there is a focus on the transition to heat pumps. They're seen as part of the solution. Um, and then there's lots said about other, uh, other options, like introducing hydrogen into our uh, gas uh, to give us some kind of CO2 reduction with, by, 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 um, by introducing the hydrogen. And, and uh, the numbers I've just recently seen suggest that if we were to introduce up to 20% hydrogen into our natural gas supply at this precise moment in time, we might get something like a 6% reduction in CO2 emissions, which, you know, okay, it, it, I wouldn't say it's significant, but it's obviously an assistance. And it would help us in this transition period whilst we move into, you know, obviously using generated electricity from renewable sources. There's a reduction uh, in CO2 emissions from electrical generations and what we call a move to primary, primary energy factor as a measurement. Now, I mentioned earlier we were looking at CO, grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. But moving to PEF or primary energy factor is actually quite a significant change and I'll go through that in a minute. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, there's these decreased U values and the requirements for ventilation and air tightness and mechanical cooling. Um, in buildings that we probably wouldn't have thought they was, would have been needed in, in the past, but may be needed in the future, given the changes to uh, you know, the way buildings are being put together and the changes to the climate. And all these things are, are, are mentioned within the future, I understand, and, and um, are, are probably worth spending some time thinking about. Uh, let's move on to the uh, building regulations primary energy factor. Uh, obviously, it is a, it's a sum. Um, it's looking at the CO2 emissions that have been generated of, from our electricity. Um, the sum is in front of you there. And to give you some idea of, of what this actually means, is, is if I look at a dwelling, um, should we call this dwelling A, with a 90% efficient gas boiler, heating demand of 10,000 kilowatt hours, looking at the primary energy factor of mains gas, which, is, which will be 1.130. Um, the associated primary energy would be 10,000 divide, divided by 0.9 times so 1.13 gives us a, a CO2 emissions for that building around about 12,500 kilowatt hours. Now, if I move that to dwelling B, which is basically the same dwelling, but I then put a, 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 a heat pump that's 300% efficient, but it's got a seasonal efficiency performance of three. Um, Obviously, using 10,000 kilowatt hours as its energy, the P factor of electricity is 1.15. The associated prime energy would be 10,000 divided by three uh, times 0.1.5. That would give you a CO2 emission number or kilowatt hour emission number of, of 5,000, which is significantly different. And it, it kind of shows how um, this would uh, this change would make the drive towards using electricity-driven systems, uh, such as heat pumps. In, in a significant number of our buildings, probably, uh, mainly focusing on new buildings at this moment in time. The uh, numbers that are behind the standard you can see here, uh, if I look at the standard CO2 emissions um, that have been produced by BRE, um, and again we're looking at the year on average because there's a highs and lows, if you're looking for renewable energy, yeah, you're going to be looking at the, the most of that being generated in the summer, whereas in the winter time you're not going to get so much in the way of electricity generated from solar, but you're obviously going to get a significant amount from wind farms. And obviously the worst time of year is when it's cold and dark and grey, not, not very windy. Um, so there is some kind of re resilience needed to be built into the system. But these are the numbers that are being looked at in the, uh, within the future home standard. And you can also look at the electricity being generated, so the CO2 emissions being generated from mains gas, LPG and heating oil, and all of which are, are going to be subject to some kind of change because there's going to be movements in the way that some of these fuels are constructed. With that in mind, um, the Heat Pump Association actually uh, put together a paper that um, 
uh, that was issued back in November. Uh, and, and one of the pieces of data that came out of it is that we could see uh, you know, some of the information that's coming about at CCC and also some of our own uh, uh, simulations could see a significant change in the number of heat pumps that are going to need to be installed. We're going to move from a base of about 25,000 heat pumps now to about 1.1 million by 2030. That's a massive change in the way that the industry needs to transform. And it's a significant challenge that is every, that people are looking at this precise moment in time. But it's the kind of change that would have to happen if we're going to reach our targets to zero CO2 emissions by 2050. So we're, as, as an association, the Pump Association is, is hoping that we, you know, that the, the, the new version of building regulations will put a very clear signal into making this change or this transition into to electric heating so that we can get on the road and start making the changes. And things like skills, training of installers are, fun, are absolutely paramount in of what we need to do. As I said earlier, the key policy timelines looks like this. Uh, we've obviously got 2019 going on at the moment. The roadmap's in place. Decarbonisation roadmap is in place. Government policies will need to be necessary to drive the transition to low carbon heat. Manufacturers, consultants, um, installers will need a clear roadmap on how to develop the necessary infrastructure. And that would mean looking at the way we di distribute our electricity. I think there's some work, some, some significant work needed in that particular area, but that can go hand in hand with this requirement for charging points within people's homes for electric vehicles. Um, UK industry, as I just said, has to improve um, itself significantly and to improve its skills. And, and, and they are just some of the um, issues that need to be sorted through uh, once we've received some clear signals from government on the trajectory to get us to zero by 2050. So how can heat pumps provide a solution? Well, um, you know, th there are some basic things that we need to understand. Obviously, the more efficient a heat pump is, the better it is. Uh, and we have to be careful in some of, those, in some of those areas. Some of the data that we use is not clear. and We need to make sure that if we're specifying a heat pump, uh, to be used both commercially and domestic is actually sized correctly for the uh, for the building and then it is also using the relevant conditions you know sometimes you see heat pumps specified with what i would call irrelevant conditions like a very low ambient condition or perhaps even a very high indoor condition uh, carbon emission factors used to quite energy consumption which we did through the primary any primary energy factors are are obviously paramount and there will be a lot of information that will be going through to actually uh, for manufacturers to help people over this this change and I, sus I suspect there'll be a fair amount of CPD work going on um, and as I said earlier primary factory set out to be the main basis for compliance under part L um, at this point I could actually disappear through the Dyke in UK's website and show you all the products but actually I'm not, I'm not going to do that because that's not, not not the point of this is that heat pumps are part of that and there are lots of other manufacturers out there with with heat pump solutions and they should all be looked at uh, as equally as an opportunity to be able to reduce CO2 emissions for buildings and achieve comfort for your customers. Well, one of the things that I am going to do is, is there are some some changes in the way and system the way systems are going to be looked at. So I I thought I would just quickly show you a uh, one of the systems that Daikin are using are working on, and it's being used by other manufacturers as well, which is what we call an ambient loop heat pump solution, where we actually take some central water from from low grade heat. Now this could be from a heat pump, it could be from ground source, it could be from surface water, or it could be uh, from boreholes. And in effect, what we're taking is we're taking this energy uh, from this low grade heat, putting it through a device that we call an Altherm heat pump that uh, is, resides in people's buildings or uh, homes, um, and will be able to supply you with either underfloor heating or some, uh, some cooling from fan core units, and also supply you with hot water. Uh, obviously, a wide range, wide range of uh, operation, and obviously, loop temperatures can vary, and heat reduction is obviously required in cooling for some some of these solutions um, and again if you were to look at these types of solutions it could be it, it's scalable you could move it up to different sizes of buildings but some of the COP numbers we're looking at are quite quite impressive especially when you start to look at uh, upping the ambient the, the, the low temperature loop up to about 25 degrees you can see COPs there ranging from 5.7 to 11. Now, I'm not going to go into the details behind all of this because that in itself is quite a detailed presentation. Um, but that, they're the kind of ideas that are being spoken about at this precise moment in time. 
Um, obviously, again, refrigerants is, is something that's very clearly something of focus for manufacturers. Uh, Daikin itself uses R32, which reduces the amount of CO, the global warming potential for gases. Other manufacturers are using other gases. And, and what you're going to see is, is, is a move away from uh, high global warming potential gases and uh, ways of making sure the refrigerants are kept in there because obviously all heat pumps work mainly on vapor compression cycle these days. Um, and that's going to reduce the amount of, of, of uh, gas that's being used within these systems. It's going to manage the amount of gas that possibly could leak out and then detect things, in, in, obviously detect leaks as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and, and get to a situation where we are using refrigerants that have got a, a lower global warming impact on, on the environment, but again, which is an important part that manufacturers are, are, are trying to drive at this moment in time. So uh, I, I hope I've given you uh, enough information to give to, to actually go through, uh, understand what was going to happen with the future home standard. And I've also I've spoken to you about how we um, you know, CO2 emissions from electric generation is actually helping us drive down and will help us achieve our target of net zero emissions by 20, net zero emissions by 2050. Um, thank you for that. And I'll pass back to Jordan now for uh, any questions. Thank you, Graham. So we have had a few questions come in, so I'll just go through them. Uh, let's have a look. So what the first question is, with the significant benefit of air source, what do you think is holding back the take up? Um, I actually think it's the, uh, if I look commercially, I think they're being, uh, heat pumps are being used more widely, but domestically, it, it, I, I believe there's a, a um, resistance by installers uh, to actually take up a heat pump, because it's very easy to install a boiler these days. It's less, it's less easy to install a heat pump into someone's existing home. Um, and so, so focusing on something like new build will help us build up the installer base. Um, and, and people just need to understand that actually having a boiler on the wall would be replaced by something that sat outside and will work in a slightly different way to a boiler. So I, I think it's both developers and, and, and I think it's also installers that are causing the issue and it's, it's something that we, we need to try and fix. Okay, that's lovely. So next we've got, with the drive to electrically powered vehicles and electrically powered heat pump technology, do we have sufficient generation available? I think the answer to that is absolutely. Um, one of the things that we've benefited from as being part of the EU is, um, e e uh, is eco design, which has driven down the amount of electricity used for devices. Um, and we actually, I believe we actually reached peak electricity around about 2009. The amount of electricity we currently use is on the way down. Now, moving to um, generate, uh, putting charges into cars and, and, and moving into uh, electrically heated systems will be a challenge. Um, but managing the, the actual the mix of that is going to be quite, it needs to be done quite cleverly. And obviously there are the devices out there that can, do, that can do that at the moment. I think the distribution of the electricity is going to cause some of some issues. I think there's going to be some infrastructure changes that are needed. Um, but as it currently stands, I, I can't see us having a situation where we would run out of electricity at this precise point in time. Okay, that's great. Um, so next we've got, how will power supplies be maintained and how resilient will that be? Or will homes also need a battery or portable generation backup? Uh, whether it's a battery or it's a device for storing heat, I don't know, but I think in people's homes in the future, there will be some form of energy storage. A battery may well be. Uh, people have been looking at using old Tesla batteries, I believe, for certain for certain items. Uh, I, 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 you know, there needs to be some form of um, understanding how that will work. And there's also some micro power, uh, micro generation systems that are being produced by our manufacturers. Uh, so, I, I, I think what will happen is is, is the generation uh, levels will remain the same, but we'll just store our energy in these different ways. I mean, one of the ways you could be doing it is, is if, if your electric vehicle has got all its charge, we might actually start using some of the charge from that to run, to your, run your heating system. And, and to do that, you need the sophisticated controls and understanding of what, what's going on um, from a personal perspective, but also from a, from a local and a national perspective as well. 
So yes, I think there'll be some form of energy storage in people's homes. Okay, um, then we have <clears throat> someone asking, what about heat collection from uh, wastewater or sewage? Actually, that was quite interesting. There was uh, there's a big piece in it in uh, Future Home Standards. Someone's done a good piece of work on it, and it obviously works. It depends on how much energy, how much wastewater you've got. So, from a from my own again, my own personal perspective, I would suggest that probably putting a heat reclaim device in someone's home may not be the best thing, but definitely put it into a hotel or somewhere where you've got a lot of wastewater going on to reclaim as much energy as you possibly can. And, and anything that reclaims energy that we can reuse, it's, it's got to have a green tick by it in my mind. It's just the suitability for it in all applications. Okay, that's lovely. Um, so next we've um, Got someone asking, uh, they'd like to know the average cost of installing a ground source heat pump for domestic. <coughs> um, I'm going to skip that one because there are lots of other bits of information out there. Uh, I, what I can say is it is more expensive to put a ground source heat pump in, but um, that's because not because of the heat pump itself, the prices are roughly the same. This to do with the amount of extra work you have to do to put in a ground source heat pump. And I don't think it's fair to me, make, for me to make a comparison at this precise moment in time because each application is different. Okay, brilliant. Um, so next we've got, do heat pumps work in all climates? Thinking specifically Scotland and the north, how efficient are they when ambient temperatures can be very low all year round? Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Heat pumps uh, will still deliver heat when the temperature outside is minus 25, just they have to work a lot harder. Uh, and, and then when you start to look at the seasonal efficiency criteria, which takes away this, what I would call spot energy efficiency ratio or COP numbers, where we were looking at a particular outside condition seasonally, we, we have to look at it from minus 10 all the way up to plus 16 or plus 17 degrees in heating. Um, and it wouldn't surprise you that the UK, when they look at that, we only end up with about one or two hours uh, at minus 10, but a significant number of hours in the middle there between sort of plus two up to about uh, plus 10. So um, heat pumps will work at that level. Uh, they're not always as efficient as they should be at that uh, very low temperatures, but they can work. And when you look at it seasonally, we can quite reasonably expect to get seasonal efficiencies of three. So um, heat, heat pumps will work in the UK very well. In fact, I've heard it said that the UK is actually a um, in the ideal spot to use renewable technologies such as air source heat pumps and for, and for wind and also solar generation. Okay, brilliant. Um, so just ask a couple more um, and then we can move on from questions. Um, so what will the life cycle of a air source heat pump generally be? Okay, you're ten, looking 10 to 15 years. And that's, that's generally what you're looking at at this precise moment in time. Um, it obviously depends on use, and people change them sometimes before that, but, but in essence, you're looking at 10 to 15 years in general, and that's the numbers that are being used by government and um, other area, uh, other bodies as well. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, so I'll just ask one more. Um, so we've just got a question come in. So not all homes have enough room to install a heat pump externally. So can they be installed within a loft, for example? Uh, wouldn't put an air source heat pump in there, but I would put a uh, some kind of uh, uh, heat, heat pump that um, uh, has got access to the amount, the right amount of air that's coming in through some grills, etc. It's a bit of a different, a bit of a diff difficult one in, in 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 that context, and and perhaps homes of that nature may. Uh, be serviced by, shall we say, an area, a heat pump that would do all five or ten homes. And there's lots of examples of that being worked out in both ground source and air source solutions. Um, we have 20 homes, none of which have got enough space to actually put a heat pump in, but at the end of the block or the end of the road, there, there, is, a, there is a communal heat pump system, and the amount of energy they, they use gets met, uh, gets um, Meet, meet it and they pay a bill that looks not only at the electricity but the amount of uh, the amount of usage that they've had out of the heat pump itself. Okay, that's brilliant. So thank you very much for your time this morning, Graham. Um, so I'd just like to take the opportunity to mention the next webinar. Um, so it's on the 12th of February 
on the subject of getting to the core of mental health presented by Don Burgess of Don Burgess Wellbeing. Um, so this is available to register for on the CAVE website and there'll also be a link included in the email that you'll all receive um, for taking part in this morning's session. Um, so other things I'd like to mention include um, a new course that we're introducing um, called Future Homes Part L. So that is on the 27th of February at KPHQ. If you are interested, please email the training at cbuildy.com email address for more information. Um, just a quick note uh, for those of you who are interested, within the next month, all CAVE regions will be holding their AGMs. So please go to the um, CAVE website for more information about your region's AGM. Um, so I'd just like to take the time to thank Graham and everyone who has joined us this morning. Just to remind you all that this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the next hour or so. If there is anyone that has viewed today's session and think it would benefit a colleague, please do share the link with them so that they can catch up at their leisure. If you've got any feedback on webinars or any sessions you would like to see us cover, any specific topics, regulations or anything industry related that you think would be a good 40 to 50 minute presentation, please do get in touch. Alternatively, if you think that you yourself could present one of our webinars, again, please let us know. We would love to have you all on board. With that, I'll wrap up. Thank you again for your time this morning and hopefully we'll see you online next month. Thank you again, Graham. Thank you. Hope it was okay.